Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. We're, we're just jump right in. Uh, you remember the story of uh, Naomi and Ruth, her daughter-in-law, have, uh, have, are knit together in a loyal love to each other after death had taken husband and, and the two sons of Naomi, one of which who had married Ruth. Now they're heading back after this famine to Bethlehem, Naomi's hometown, and here's where the text picks up, Ruth 1.19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and Yahweh has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when Yahweh has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Well, despite having been gone for about 10 years, the people there in Bethlehem, they still remembered Naomi and her family. It's interesting because the word there for stirred um, is a little bit more boisterous than that. Like on the negative side, you can almost call it a riot. Um, On the positive side, it'd be like a welcome wagon, like everyone came out to say hello. Not sure if this is positive or negative, that they're coming out because they're angry or something, or if uh, this is the welcome wagon, but it does make specific mention that um, the whole town was stirred, but it was the women who engaged in the discussion, and uh, maybe the women were just excited about something new to gossip about. Um, You might, you might, I mean, I would be interested. I mean, what happened? You were gone for 10 years, and she has a very tragic story. So, of course, you might be interested. But um, Naomi's response pretty much shuts down any discussion. She just kills the conversation right away. Why do you call me Naomi, which means pleasant? Call me Mara, which means bitter. Um, And then she describes what has done, not in any kind of detailed way, but basically that God has afflicted her. Now, she uses an interesting title for God, which is Almighty. Uh, If you've ever heard um, the term El Shaddai, okay, El meaning God, and Shaddai is this word Almighty. Um, It refers to God's power. And in this case, God being powerful is not just to, let's say, create, but also to destroy. And so Naomi is calling him the Almighty because, in a sense, God has shown his power in in taking from her. She went away full. She came back empty. There's an irony there, right? Because when she left, why did she leave Bethlehem? Because there was a famine. So her stomach was empty, and she went to Moab to be full. But the irony is she went full, meaning she had a full family, husband, two sons, and now she's coming back empty. It's, again, one of those maybe subtle ways that tell us that Naomi's choice originally and Elimelech's choice to go to Moab might have not been a faithful one because they were leaving God's promised land to go to this pagan land where they worshiped other gods. Her sons marry pagan women, Moabites, who were not allowed into the assembly of of Yahweh, if you remember that from last week. So um, she's she's bitter. She is uh, seeing things as not having turned out the way she would like. She talks about how God has testified against her or spoken against her, or you could see that as a bringing judgment, calling her into account, and that he brought about calamity. Now, this word calamity, uh, ra in Hebrew, it can also mean evil. Now, we know God doesn't do evil, but in the Hebrew, you know, lexicon, the word for calamity and evil is the same. And it's not because all calamity is inherently, you know, morally sinful. Yeah, Ka. Sure. We're, we're going to get to that. You are, you are speaking the next point of this sermon. So you're, you're asking the right questions, buddy. Thanks for listening. That's great. Yeah, so, so it's kind of interesting. In the Hebrew, like the word for a calamity or disaster, which is not like a moral thing, like if a tree, you know, uh, a hurricane blows through, like that's, you know, that's not like a, a good act. Like in heaven, there's not going to be tornadoes that destroy things, but it's not like the tornado's doing it out of sin. You know, it's not like it's sinning by doing that. It's like an amoral act. 
But then raw evil is like an, an explicitly moral evil kind of act. And in Hebrew, at least, it's only context that determines whether it's like calamity or disaster or like evil. Now, we know God doesn't do evil, and yet there is a sense in which evil is happening and God um, has a purpose and a plan for it, to your question. So let's actually, let's do this by example. On the one hand, Naomi is correct, in a sense, to say, God, if it wasn't for God, these things wouldn't have happened. Is that true? Yeah, if it wasn't for God, these things, these tragedies wouldn't have come upon her. It was ultimately uh, his sovereign plan. On the other hand, it was Naomi's choice to go out from the promised land into a pagan land, and it was even her choice now to be bitter with God. I mean, she's saying the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me, which is sort of true, but her response of bitterness in return, does she have to be bitter about what is happening? In other words, or think of it this way, for her to be bitter now is to make an ultimate judgment about God's plan, that it is bad, that it is ultimately bitter, a bitter pill to swallow. But her bitterness is a choice. She doesn't have to be bitter in this moment because does she really know how this is all going to pan out? Is she God that she can say that this is definitively right now, I am justified to feel this way because there's no way, absolutely no way this could turn out for anything positive or good at all? Can, is she really in a position to make that kind of judgment? Well, no, she's not. So her bitterness is a choice. Remember Joseph, who was hated by his brothers. He was thrown in a pit. He ends up being sold as a slave. He works in some Egyptian, some pagan Egyptian's house. He actually gains his trust, his, works his way all the way up to be the, the head of the household, even second only to Potiphar himself. And then his wife accuses uh, Joseph of, of um, inappropriate behavior, and he gets thrown in jail. And he's at the lowest dungeon of this jail. And then he gains the trust of the jailer, works his way up to be second. He's in charge of all the other prisoners in jail. And never once <clears throat> did he become bitter. Never once do you read in any of that account where he threw an angry fist at God. Why is this happening to me? I can't believe he did this to me. I didn't do anything to deserve this. Instead, <clears throat> he chose to keep serving the Lord wherever he was. It was certainly evil and tragic, the things that had happened to him. It is wrong that sin was committed against him. It was wrong that he suffered so much loss. Um, he lost his family. He lost um, that, uh, his relationship with his dad. He, you know, his, he, he lost even what little bit he had in Potiphar's house. You know, he had a little bit there, and then he lost that. So he lost a lot of things. That was evil, and that was tra tragic. But he never once blamed God for them in an accusatory sense. Now, God is, again, somehow mysteriously, without him, none of this would happen, and yet he is not the, uh, he does not sin. He does not do evil things. Um, when he gets out of the jail, he goes into the house of the Pharaoh himself. He is, you know, you can read the whole story. It's a tremendous story. And he ends up being second in charge of Egypt. He ends up sparing Egypt from a famine, like here. And he also ends up saving his own brothers, his stinking brothers, and their dad and all of his household from this famine because God gave him prophetic insight to know this famine was coming and so they could store up grain. God used him in that position. Where it, the way he got there was full of evil. None of it of his own doing even. He was a victim, you could say, in every step of the way, but he never saw it that way. Never blamed God that way. Why is this happening to me? Such that he could say, Genesis 50, 20, you gotta, this is a verse for every time you know, you're thinking about, oh, does, you know, God, uh, is God evil and does God do evil? Um, Genesis 50, 20, he's talking to his brothers after they've reconciled. And he says, as for you, you meant evil against me. Wrong. But God meant it for good. 
for the saving of many souls. So you intended it, you did evil, but simultaneously God was doing and intending good in the evil. That is a paradox, you know, to your question, Kyle. Like, there's not like a, a neat way to just kind of like separate this out because they did evil and it was necessary for that evil to happen for Joseph to be where he was so that he could do this good. But God is not in any way commending the evil they did. In fact, it's judgment worthy. But it's like, well, how can you judge them for doing the thing the evil things they did that would put Joseph in a position to save them. Well, God can, God's God, he's allowed to have that privilege to even use our evil for good. So um, I think there's a lot to wrestle with there, frankly. It takes a lot of humility to embrace that. Um, but this is actually the substance of faith. It's sad and tragic to lose your sons and your husband, but it's not necessarily soul-destroying or faith destroying. It's not necessarily you have to be mad or angry or bitter at God. Like Job in Job 2.10, after he lost everything, he says to his wife, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Wrong. So he was willing to say, this too must be part of a plan. God, you're not evil, but you're letting evil happen for some good purpose. And so Naomi is faced with this very dilemma. We are faced with it too. But this expression of Naomi's doesn't mean that she's irredeemable. Yes, in the moment, she's bitter. This tragedy has come upon her, and you might feel very, very sympathetic to her cause if you've ever suffered loss yourself. But part of the story of Ruth is that this was not for no reason. There is good that would come from this calamity. If you think about it, if her son had not died, Ruth would not have married Boaz. Again, spoiler alert if you don't know the story of Ruth. And King David would not have been born. And if King David would not have been born, then who else would not have been born? Jesus. So this had to have happened this way. You know, uh, her husband had to die. We don't, actually, I don't know if we know whether it's Malone or Killian um, that she was married to, even. Now, poor guy. I mean, I don't know that he was a bad guy. I'm not saying that he was some terrible sinner. He deserved to die, and he was wicked or anything like that. But he was going to die someday, you know? Ruth's husband was going to die someday, just as we all do. When, where, how, that's all up to God's purview to, to make it for the best. So even if her husband was a very faithful man. You'd hope she was, or he was. Um, he, his death at that time was part of God's purpose that Ruth would meet Boaz, marry him, and again, all the things we just said. We have to be able to look at it that way. The thing is, you, you don't always know the end. You don't know the end of how the story's gonna go uh, until it's the end of the story. So we have to refrain from judgment. You know, judging God until we know the end of the story. Now, we do know the ultimate end of the story. We have scripture. So we can say, okay, well, all things are going to work together for good for those who love God and called according to his purpose. So we do know in that sense. But if you want to know exactly why, you know, you have, you know, this uh, stomach affliction or why uh, someone you love died, some of that we may not know until we're in heaven. And we can look back and say, God, this was part of a perfect plan. I just couldn't see the whole thing. Um, but now I do. That's the first lesson that we see there. That was exactly to your point, Kyle. <clears throat> Next, we see the harvest in Bethlehem. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man. This is Ruth 2, continuing on. A worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite, it's emphasizing that she was a Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. <clears throat> now, this is a setup. We need to set this up. Chapter 2 begins with the mention of Boaz. He's a relative of Elimelech. 
uh, who was Naomi's husband, and he's a worthy man. The Hebrew word is gabor. Uh, it's usually applied to warriors. It can, it can mean like a mighty warrior, someone who is heroic. It's a, the word is a mixture of strength and honor and dignity. Uh, you can even just, it can even just mean like manly, <laughs> all right? Now, I think it's important to note here that this word could be used to apply to people like David's mighty men. What did David's my, mighty men do? They would uh, fight uh, lions in, on a snowy day, right? They would defeat Philistines by the hundreds. These tremendous acts of physical prowess and loyalty. I mean, there's time when, when David said, oh, I wish I could have a drink of water from this well in my hometown, but, you know, Saul's there. And, and so these mighty men fought through just to get him a drink of water from this well he requested. Very loyal. So their strength is seen in their loyalty. Their strength is seen in their, uh, their, their physical prowess. But Boaz here is called a worthy man, a mighty man, but he doesn't perform any stunning feats of strength. How does he show strength? In, the, in these texts. You'll see it, but he's going to show th- strength in his generosity, his compassion, and his love. There's uh, many ways to be strong. You know, there's many ways to be a mighty man. They don't all involve, I, I've mentioned them before, but when I was a kid, I remember in elementary school, the power team came to our elementary school, and they would do things like bend frying pans and break chains, and there's this Christian group And they would talk about being mighty in the Lord. And they would talk about how your physical strength doesn't matter if you you don't know the Lord. It's a great little gospel witness. But they do all these crazy feats of strength. You will see none of that from Boaz. Instead, you'll see a strength of his character. You'll see the strength um, of his true manliness. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, it sounds like Ruth was aware of this uh, Boaz and was going to try to find his fields to glean in, glean in but she wasn't exactly sure. Uh, there's a providence involved that she happened to come to the part of the field that was Boaz's. The sense is that this was God's leading and intervention. God led Ruth to Boaz. This was divine appointment. It wasn't necessarily some plan or set up by Naomi and Ruth. Um, there might have been an intention just to try and come up, uh, come to the land of a sympathetic person, but uh, this was God's leading. This was God's purposing in this. Now, what is gleaning? Gleaning is to pick up whatever's been left behind after the harvesters had already gone through. Specifically here, it's grain. So, um, you know, you go through, uh, when the harvesters go through, um, they're, they're, they're cutting down all the stalks of of wheat, they gather them up, and of course, not everything gets picked up. So to glean would be to go through and pick up uh, those droppings. Now, this was actually an instrumental part of how God wanted to provide for the poor and needy. Uh, I don't, I won't make too big of a, a point about this, um, but if you turn, turn to Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 21, or just listen, Deuteronomy 24, 19, The Lord says to the people, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that Yahweh your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You shall remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. In other words, there's a principle kind of built in that you don't need to get every single ounce of profit, every single penny of profit for yourself and and be so efficient that there's nothing left after the fact in your harvesting. God incorporated a system of mercy into how you were to harvest your lands. And, and you know, it wasn't, in, it's not like a handout either, like the, the, the fatherless, the, the poor and the widow, they needed to go and the soldier, they needed to go and pick it up. So it's like someone was going to do it for them. Um, so it wasn't like a, a handout, uh, but it was also something on the part of the landowners to not be greedy, to not just try 
to um, get every single last, you know, head of grain to make sure you maximize your harvest. Now, of course, you could imagine that some people in their greed would take everything. You can imagine that some in their greed might say, don't let anyone come in here after you and glean our fields. And remember, Bethlehem had just suffered a famine not too long before this, right? That's why Ruth, or that's why Naomi had left. And you can imagine that some landowners might have been inclined to forget that Deuteronomy 24 was in their Bibles during that time because it was a famine. Did you want to, you know, if there was any harvest at all, what were you going to do if there's a famine? You are going to go and pick up every single little olive and grain and fruit. And even with this full harvest, maybe the first one, because after all, uh, Naomi's back because she heard that Yahweh had visited them, Bethlehem, meaning that Yahweh had ended the famine. So maybe this is the full, first full harvest after uh, a season, 10 years of famine. Do you think people would just immediately have been generous with that first harvest? Or would some of them said, I don't know, we, you know, we just came out of a famine. What's going to happen next year? I'm not going to give everything away. Now, it's a little bit of imagining, right? Um, but you could definitely understand that maybe not everyone was generous like this, especially in the context of the famine. Now, you add to that the danger of Ruth here being a lone woman and a foreign woman, and you can sympathize, understand why Ruth <clears throat> would have been concerned about facing hostility or abuse unless she could find a sympathetic place or person <clears throat> to glean the fields of. So, which is why, you know, if, if we can find a relative of yours to glean in, that would be perfect because they're, you know, you would know them and maybe they would let me do this. Now we see some of the attributes that make Boaz this worthy man once she arrives to his field and the interaction they have. I'm going to read it for you, and then um, let me give you some of the attributes to make Boaz a worthy man and then some dating advice, um, which is very general. It'll apply to everyone, okay? (laughs) Verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, Yahweh be with you. And they answered, Yahweh bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She's the young Moabite woman who came back from Naomi, uh, with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she's continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. Yahweh repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants." First thing that we see of Boaz that makes him this worthy man in chapter 2, verse 1, is that he respects his workers. I mean, you can tell a lot about a person um, with how they treat those that are under them in in terms of a hierarchy or structure. Obviously, Boaz is the one who uh, uh, owns the land, and all of these reapers work for him. But uh, he starts the day with them, with Yahweh be with you, and they, in turn, say, Yahweh, bless you. Now, I'm cynical. I read this, and I thought, they're just trying to be nice to the boss. This is like, you know, when, when, when the manager comes in, good morning, everyone, all chipper, and everything, good morning, like that kind of thing. And it's just, you know, a cynical part of me is like, you know, he, he's all chipper and awake, but he's not the one that has to glean, you know, harvest the field. So obviously, he's like, oh, you know, Yahweh be with you. 
But I, I don't, you know, I shouldn't be cynical about this. There's absolutely no reason actually, actually to include this greeting here unless it's meant to be included as a reflection of the kind of man that Boaz is. Like, there's no reason to even have this here. It doesn't really have to do with Ruth or the story. Why would you include it except that it is supposed to be a way, an insight uh, into Boaz that he respects his workers, they respect him, he's a good boss. And do you know why Boaz is a good boss, a worthy man, a respectable man? Because Boaz has a good boss too. (laughs) Yahweh is the center of this greeting. He is God-centered as a boss, and he expects his employees to be as well. You could put it that way. Now, you know, I'm not saying that you, if you're a manager, you can compel people to worship God, but they're all Israelites. So yeah, in this case, yeah, you do, because Yahweh is your boss and their boss too. But Yahweh is the center of this greeting, and it demonstrates to the reapers who's ultimately in charge of all of them. We got one boss here this morning, fellas. It's Yahweh. And may he be with you. And they say, and may he bless you. Because for Boaz to be blessed means for them to be blessed. And this is an echoing, or this is echoed later in the New Testament. And we talked about this when we were in Ephesians, talking about bond servants obeying their masters. And then in Ephesians 6, 9, masters do the same to them in terms of showing them uh, respect um, and recognizing hard work. It says, masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there's no partiality with him. So the first way that we see that Boaz is a good, worthy man is even in just this little insight how he treats his workers and how they treat him. They are all recognized that Yahweh is their boss. Let us serve him faithfully. Secondly, how do we know that Boaz is a a good, worthy man. He doesn't just respect his workers. He respects Ruth. How does he demonstrate that he respects Ruth? There's three ways that he shows that he respects Ruth. And these are also some hints on how to treat your wife or your special lady friend. This is biblical flirting 101. This is how the worthy men do it, all right? So listen up. Now, if you're a lady in here, this is what you should expect, all right? This is what you should expect. If you are not married, then this is what uh, you, you need if you want a Boaz in your life, okay? What does he do? First, he provides for and protects Ruth. You see it there in uh, verse um, 8 when he recognizes that she is an outcast. She is someone that's on the... Uh, the edge that she's got no one to care for her or look out for her. And what does he do? He tells her, glean in the fields, glean with my other uh, female workers. I told the young man not to bother you. And if you're thirsty, drink some of this water. Just basics of provision and protection. Gives her safety Um, (laughs) make sure that she knows that she is protected. He provides the basics of water, and you just, later they're going to go on a date, basically. Um, Feet, you know, gives her food, but certainly, um, you know, gives her uh, the means to gather food to even take home to Naomi. Ruth was in a very vulnerable position, and Boaz did not take advantage of it or worsen it or ignore it. He provided and he protected for Ruth. Secondly, he praises Ruth's character and faith. So he provides and protects Ruth. Secondly, he praises Ruth's character and faith. Now we know that Ruth is hardworking. She's been there since the morning is what one of the uh, workers reports. Gleaning would not have resulted in much harvest. Um, And so, you know, this is something that really is... um, is she would have been working very hard um, to get just a very little amount. When she asks what she has done to find favor in Boaz's eyes, Boaz acknowledges both the hardship and the faith that Ruth has demonstrated in serving Naomi and leaving her home to seek refuge 
with, frankly, a whole nother people and a whole nother God. That took a lot of faith. And we talked about it already last week, so I, I won't repeat all that, that, that Ruth did in professing to Naomi that your people might be my people and your God my God, but Boaz has heard it all, and he's clearly impressed, and he communicates that to her. I've heard what all that you've done. He's a, of spiritual mind. He is someone that can understand true faith and godly character because he is also himself someone of true faith and godly character. So he recognizes that, and he praises her for it. He doesn't lead in with how she looks or you know, some description of what he likes about you know, you know, some like superficial thing. Now, I will say the Song of Psalms is very clear that you should appreciate, you know, your, your significant other's physical form. There's nothing inherently sinful about that. But you see, Boaz, in contrast to Samson, and in contrast to others that we have seen in kind of our studies, like Samson, he went after people, women, because they, you know, looked beautiful. It was a very superficial kind of thing. That's not Boaz. You know, this is the time of the judges, remember? So that's the time of the judges. Even the judges were these superficial uh, men just interested in, in uh, serving their own lusts and temptations. Boaz, no, he praises Ruth's character and faith, sees who she really is. So he provides and protects for Ruth. He praises her character and faith. And thirdly, he points to God and what he's doing through her and for her. Boaz rightly points to God as the one who sees what she has done and will ultimately reward her. The Lord uh, Yahweh repay you for what you've done and a full reward be given you by Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. A godly man will always point to the real worthy one, the true hero. It's not me. It is God. God. Boaz doesn't say anything about himself in this whole exchange. He doesn't tout how many fields he owns or how big his harvest is. He doesn't talk about um, his, his lineage. or He doesn't talk about himself hardly at all, uh, if at all. Even though he's in a position of power, dealing with a very vulnerable woman, he does not even mention his power or appeal to it, or try to manipulate her with it, or abuse her. He knows, again, just like with the workers, Yahweh is over him, Yahweh is over you, and working in you and through you, Ruth, Yahweh is over all of us. And Boaz more than implies that as far as he was concerned, Ruth was under the care of Yahweh, that she was not an outsider with Boaz, or with God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Boaz accepted her because she was accepted by the Lord. He does everything he can to put the focus on what God is doing in you. I've seen what has been going on in your faith, and now God is the one who's going to care for you. Ultimately, God is the one in charge. Ultimately, God is the one who's going to reward and if you're accepted by him, then I accept you. I mean, this is, this is it. Provide and protect. <laughs> Praise the good and noble and beautiful things about the other person and point them to Yahweh. Point them to God and not yourself. The ladies will love it, at least the godly ones. You know, guys like that too. Don't get me wrong. Um, guys like it when you praise their character and faith and, and point them to the Lord as well. But I, I just think... You can imagine all of the <clears throat> books that get written about Boaz and, and Ruth and, you know, you know, talk about dating and all that. So I'm having a little bit of fun with it. Um, and if you want more books like that, there's certainly tons of them. But you do see, it is true, you do see, like, Boaz, you're a good guy. I mean, you're a good man. I, I, I mean, if, if all men were to approach, you know, dating and women like this, I think, you, you tell me, women, if, uh, if this would appeal to you or not. If a Boaz like this, you know, you know does that appeal to you? I, I hope so. 
Um, <laughs> maybe two out of three is okay. <laughs> but uh, it, it is true. I do think that part of the tenderness and the truth of this book is intended to contrast Boaz with even some of the, the judges of Israel who were so sinful, um, especially Samson. Again, kind of leaves a bad taste in her mouth, all that he did. Um, it is to remind you of all the evilness uh, or a contrast to uh, like the Levite who cut up his concubine, right? And, and uh, the men in Gibeah who were trying to, you know, rape and, and pill like Boaz is not any of those things. He's the exact opposite of those things. And he makes it very clear. So yeah, we should take notes. Men take note. Women take note. This is, this is what a godly man um, prioritizes and is like. Ruth, for her part, she's not entitled. She's not manipulative. She's not trying to be deceitful or seductive. She's humble, uh, humble thankful. And she is seeing Yahweh providing for her more than she could ever think or hope to imagine when she told Naomi, I'll go with you to die, basically. It was not in her imagination, these things to happen. And I, I tend to think that, um, you know, I know that she had a faith in God before she came there, talked about that last week. But what an encouragement to her faith this would have been to see God lining these things up introducing these people, how could she not have felt comfort and peace in the Lord? And so, verse uh, 14 through 16, and I originally intended to go to all the way to the end of chapter 2. We won't make it. We'll end in 16. They go on a date. So you're just going to, basically, this is just a date. You're just going to read a date. <laughs> and at mealtime, it's like lunch, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine the typical um, little meal that you would have. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed through her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves. That is like not just like the, the droppings, but let her go to the actual uh, field to harvest, um, and do not reproach her, and also pull out some from the bundles for her, that which was already harvested. Take some of that out and leave it for her to glean or really just to take with her and do not rebuke her. So they have a date, <laughs> simple date. Um, and then he, he blesses her with, um, with, with more than she could have ever hoped to imagine to take home. And certainly this was also Boaz being mindful of the mother-in-law. I mean, maybe that's a fourth point. Be good with the in-laws. <laughs> Get on a good relationship with the in-laws. So maybe that's what's going on here, uh, a little bit of it. Um, but he, he basically blesses her with more than she could have imagined here. Something is happening. You can tell it. I can tell it. You already know the story. But if you didn't, you're hearing this for the first time. Um, you're anticipating that this is going to go somewhere, right? Like they're, you know, it, it, this is not just like an interest that he has in this random woman and I care for all, you know, random widows in the same way. You know, when you go on like a little date like this, no, there's something more happening there, right? And so that's the, the feeling you're supposed to get from this. This is drama. This is their version of the Hallmark Channel, okay? So <laughs> this, is, this, this was it. Um, and that's where I'm going to leave you hanging um, because next time we'll see. She's going to go home and talk to Naomi, and we'll see a little bit of a, a plan forming some wisdom on the part of the women. Um, and then, of course, um, the, the real hero of the story is going to be God himself. Now, if you're not a Christian, this afternoon, this is almost a, a kind of a peculiar uh, book because we're talking about this very personal relationship that's going on. But uh, what, what I hope you see through it is God caring, the ability for God to care in the micro and the macro, all right? Let me, let me explain that. Like, God is caring for you right now, even, let's say, in the minute details of your life. You know, I, I don't think it's wrong to ask, you know, to pray to God for a parking space sometimes when it's really full and I got all the kids in there. It just, it's going to be real tough to park really far, far away and haul them in. And I will pay, pray even for like a parking spot, right? Like God is very concerned 
on the micro scale for you individually, your needs. You can go to him. But God is also always simultaneously doing things in the macro. Like if I didn't get that parking spot or if I did, that that's also part of this bigger plan that God is doing, not just in my life, but in the lives of you know, everyone that's in that parking lot even. Does that make sense? Like God is here focusing in, the text is focusing on really just like two people in this moment. And this is like just an incidental thing, you know, this is a, you, you know you're, you're reading a date, you're, you're seeing an interaction, a very good, you know, guy, you know, um, th- this is a biblical flirting, if you want to call that, like, you know, you're just getting a little peek at just two people, but there's something bigger happening at the same time, isn't there? Like, God is going to do something not just in, let's say, redeeming Naomi and, and giving Ruth uh, a good husband after the tragedy, he's setting up for the Davidic kingdom and covenant. He's setting up for Jesus Christ himself being born, that even in the details in the micro, it's part of something much bigger. And that's just as true for Ruth and Boaz here as it is for you right now. If you're not a Christian, you're still part of this. You're still part of God's plan. And his plan for you in hearing this message is to realize that there's a God who's got a plan for everything. And if you're to defy him, if you're to disobey him, if you're to go against his commands and sin, that plan is going to include judgment. He must. He must judge sin. He must judge defiance. But he is in the Redeemer who will come from Ruth and Boaz. So this very almost just, you know, these are two people in the span of billions of of human beings who've ever lived. And yet the Bible's, you know, just focusing in on them. It's to reveal to us a Savior from our sin, Jesus Christ. God is saying to you, wherever you are, you're not a Christian, part of his plan, and he wants you to be forgiven of your sins, to call out to Jesus um, in the midst of whatever pain or suffering you're going through, and cry out for forgiveness and salvation, and he will save. If you're a Christian this morning, I mean, it's the same general truth, that, that even the bad things that are happening in the micro, you know, in the and the, the evilness that you're experiencing, the tragedies that have come, uh, come upon you, there's something bigger happening. You know, when you look at it on a very small scale, it can be very sad. Um, it, can, it can be a huge burden. But uh, if you're willing and if you're able to step back and ask, you know, God, what are you doing in the big picture? Um, oftentimes, God is doing things you couldn't imagine. They're so good for everyone including you. Be reminded of that. Also, again, if you're a believer, don't settle for less than a Boaz. <laughs> no. um, see in him a, a paradigm, very simple. I mean, it's only just a few verses, but you just see such character in the man. Um, look for a Boaz. <laughs> Find a Boaz. Uh, encourage, be encouraged to be a Boaz. Um, you could probably start a whole ministry in the Boaz ministries, maybe someone has. But let us start with you uh, and having that right expectation. Let us be a church that encourages men to be of this kind of character as well. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that, um, again, your word is, is speaking into real time and experiences. It's not like any of these situations are so hard to imagine, uh, and yet it is dramatic. It is the very redemptive history unfolding on this almost random barley field in Bethlehem. This is, this is history that matters for time and for eternity. Who knows when we are ourselves in that moment where the things that we say and do and experience, how we respond to situations is, is not a moment that is going to resound for time and for eternity. Uh, we don't know, so we should always act like they are. And in truth, every moment that you've ordained for us is a moment where we're able to to um, seek after you, to choose you, to want to uh, bless and honor your name. So help us to do that and help us to be reminded of that uh, today as we've read your word. Thank you, God. We we ask that we would uh, take these things, bury them deep in our hearts so that they might bear fruit uh, throughout this week that would be a blessing to us and to others. And pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all, and we will see you, Lord willing, uh, next week. We've got Bible studies and everything else going on. You guys know that, but you guys know the drill. But if you need any reminders about what's happening this week, grab a bulletin if you haven't already.